We are ready, everybody. We are ready. Uh, please, uh, please join me in um, in welcoming uh, the director of the Burbank Public Library, Elizabeth Goldman, uh, and our very special guest this evening, uh, Susan Arleen. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Now I feel very loud. Um, I'm Elizabeth Goldman. I'm the Library Services Director for the City of Burbank. And I am very pleased to be here tonight with our New York Times bestselling author, Susan Arlene. And she is here to discuss her latest work, the library book. which this book tells the interconnected stories of the 1986 fire at the LA Central Library, the history of the whole Los Angeles public library system. Next one will be about Burbank, I assume, since you're so familiar. <laughs> yes, <laughs> now that I know it this well, yes. And also the role of books and stories and libraries in our lives and our society. Um, Ms. Orlean is a very accomplished author of 10 books, including The Orchid Thief, which was made into the film adaptation. She's a staff writer of The New Yorker and received an honorary doctorate from her alma mater at the University of Michigan, which happens to be where I got my library science degree. So that's one oh, little connection that you and I have. Um, after growing up a library user in Cleveland, Ohio, she worked all over the country and uh, moved to Los Angeles in 2011. And living here with her young son, she rediscovered the public library system and, that, and heard about the fire, and that led her on the journey to the book today. So please join me in welcoming Susan Orlean. So as I mentioned, there's three, there's three different threads running through your book. And the first one I want to talk about is the fire. Um, like you, I, did not, I was not living in Los Angeles in 1986. I had not heard of it before I moved here either. It's a very fascinating story. Um, and there was one although it's never been determined conclusively, there was one prime suspect, a man named Harry Peake. You describe his life, his stories about what happened that day, and the conclusions made by investigators past and present about the causes of the fire. I was wondering if you could start off just reading the first two pages um, where you tell the story of Harry and the fire. The very first yes. two pages of the book, okay. Even in Los Angeles, where there is no shortage of remarkable hairdos, Harry Peake attracted attention. He was very blonde, very, very blonde, his lawyer said to me, and then he fluttered his hand across his forehead, performing a pantomime of Peake's heavy swoop of bangs. Another lawyer, who questioned Peake in a deposition, remembered his hair very well. He had a lot of it, she said, and he was very definitely blonde. An arson investigator I met described Peek entering a courtroom with all that hair, as if his hair existed independently. <laughs> Having a presence mattered a great deal to Harry Peek. He was born in 1959 and grew up in Santa Fe Springs, a town in the Paddle Flat Valley less than an hour southeast of Los Angeles, hemmed in by the dun-colored Santa Rosa Hills and a looming sense of monotony. It was a place that offered the soothing uneventfulness of conformity, but Harry longed to stand out. As a kid, he dabbled in the minor delinquencies and pranks that delighted an audience. Girls liked him. He was charming, funny, dimpled, daring. He could talk anyone into anything. He had a gift for drama and invention. He was a storyteller, a yarn spinner, and an agile liar. He was good at fancying up facts to make his life seem less plain and mingy. According to his sister, he was the biggest bullshitter in the world, so quick to fib and fabricate that even his own family didn't believe a word he said. The closeness of Hollywood's constant beckoning, combined with his knack for performance, meant almost predictably that Harry Peake decided to become an actor. 
After he finished high school and served a stint in the Army, Harry moved to Los Angeles and started dreaming. He began dropping the phrase, when I'm a movie star, into his conversations. He always said when and not if. For him, it was a statement of fact rather than speculation. Although they never actually saw him in any television shows or movies, his family was under the impression that during his time in Hollywood, Harry landed some promising parts. His father told me Harry was on a medical show, Mary, maybe General Hospital, and that he had roles in several movies, including the trial of Billy Jack. IMDB, the world's largest online database for movies and television, lists a Barry Peak, a Perry Peak, a Harry Peacock, a Barry Pearl, and even a Harry Peak of Plymouth, England. But there is nothing at all listed for a Harry Peak of Los Angeles. As far as I can tell, the only time Harry Peak appeared on screen was on the local news in 1987 after he was arrested for setting the Los Angeles Central Library on fire destroying almost a half million books and damaging 700,000 more. It was one of the biggest fires in the history of Los Angeles, and it was the single biggest library fire in the history of the United States. Now you want to read more, right? It's a great start. <laughs> So it was never proven even how the fire started, never mind that Harry was the one who did it. So why did you choose to start off the book with him and then weave so much of his own story in there? What intrigued you about him? Oh, well, he was arrested. And while I won't give away the entire uh, crime story of the book, he, he was pursued, and I would say most of the arson investigators remain convinced that he did it. So a, suce a successful prosecution um, maybe never occurred, but there was ample reason to assume that he may well have been the person who started the fire. Part of the reason, you know, I felt that you couldn't tell the story of the fire without telling the story of this entire arson investigation. And there was never any other um, suspect. There was never anyone else who was even a promising suspect. But it was also a story about stories. Harry had seven different alibis for where he was the day of the fire. And just FYI, if you're going to say you didn't do something, don't have seven alibis. <laughs> Stick with one. Um, because the book ultimately is so much about the nature of storytelling and memory, it became very interesting to me that this suspect became, in his own way, a storyteller. He told story after story of what had really happened that day. And it seemed almost fitting to, to follow his story and trace the process of the investigation. Mm -hmm. um, and his family also seemed to like to tell stories about him. They gave you a lot of access. His, his surviving sisters. Um, have you heard from them since the book was published? I have not. And that's always an interesting thing when uh, you write something, whether it's a magazine piece or a book, and you wait. Sometimes you never hear from people, which is interesting. Um, and sometimes you get reactions that are entirely different from what you expect. So. You kind of have to go into it knowing that you're not sure if the outcome will be that someone will say, you painted such an accurate portrait of our family, or they'll say, I hate it. Um, you, you never know. But I haven't heard from them. And I'm, I'm curious, of <laughs> course. In your experience, having written, in, um, most of your books have involved, have been nonfiction and involved interviewing people in, who are still alive. Have you, in your experience, are people almost always willing to talk and tell stories, even if it's not the most flattering portrait of themselves or others? You know, that is the miracle of um, human vanity, I think. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm often 
thrilled to see that uh, people, first of all, everybody, we all love to be listened to, everybody. And it is often, I think, that transaction that makes people willing to talk to writers because it's wonderful to have your, your story heard and to have somebody who's very interested in it. It's also very much a one-way street. It's not that I, like a friend, would say, okay, now it's my turn, now I get to talk. Because when you're writing about someone, there it's never your turn. So it's a completely, it's a one-way street in, in their favor of being listened to. I also feel that people really want to explain themselves. So it's not just vanity. I mean, I'm, I'm mostly joking when I say that it's vanity, but I think it serves this desire that we all have to, to make ourselves known and to make the stories that we know um, understood. So you use the fire as a jumping off point for a lot of the history of the whole Los Angeles public library system, libraries in general, the development of the city of Los Angeles, the role of librarians and libraries in our lives, and the characters who fill libraries in the form of both staff and the library users. Mm -hmm. um, on page 32, you wrote something I really liked. The, the library is the gathering pool of narratives and of the people who come to find them. It is where we can glimpse immortality. In the library, we can live forever. And then uh, uh, later you list some of the items lost in the fire as if um, reading a memorial of soldiers killed in war almost, a volume of Don Quixote from 1860, all the biographies in subjects H through K, 90,000 books about science, 12,000 cookbooks, including six just about popcorn. <laughs> and you describe the total number of books um, damaged or destroyed as the equivalent of about 15 branch libraries. I actually looked up, based on the number in this particular library, the number of books that were damaged or destroyed in the fire would be seven times the collection at this branch, wow. just to give you a picture. Well, I mean, simply the, the staggering number, 400,000 destroyed, 700,000, that were damaged that had to be placed in cold storage so they wouldn't mold. They had to be frozen and they were frozen for years while the library was being rebuilt and then they had to be not just thawed but they had to be carefully um, dried out, not just thawed but have the water expressed out of the books. So the, just the volume, you know, if you think on short notice, you need to find somewhere where you can put 700,000 books in a freezer. It's not easy to do. And actually, I found it quite wonderful that all of the food, um, frozen food warehouses made space in their freezers just, I'm sure 700,000 books would more than fill this room. So it, it was a staggering, uh, just mass of books that had to be placed in, in cold storage. Nobody knew how long they would be frozen, and no one knew whether they would be reparable when they were finally able to be treated and thought out. The happy news is that a large majority of the ones that got frozen were actually saved. They were thawed out and dried out, and if they needed a new binding, they were rebound, but they were, a remarkable number of them ended up being able to go back into the library. Then you have that other issue, which is the new library opens, and you have two million books that have to be brought into the library. Um, amazing number of books. And the people of Los Angeles volunteered and because the librarians alone could never do it or it would take forever. So it was a volunteer effort to bring those books back and help shelve them and make sure that the library could re reopen in a relatively 
um, short amount of time, which is fairly remarkable. Yeah, one of the amazing things is how many people at all points throughout the experience of the fire and the aftermath and the rebuilding and reshelving, as you said, volunteered to help out, whether it was the companies reading the books or the fundraisers or um, people actually coming out to do anything that they could. What did that tell you about the role the library played in their Well, life? I think that the it, it really told me two things. First of all, and the thing that really compelled me to write the book is that we feel something deeply emotional about libraries. There, they are, there is something magical about them. There's something that makes them feel truly special. It's, there's a reason that oppressive governments burn libraries because it really hits people in the gut. It's a way of making it feel as if your proxy is being destroyed. It feels more human than just a, a set of th 300 pages. It feels like something truly human is in those books. So when the library suffered this calamity, people really rallied because there was this emotion that it brought out. And just as a little backstory, and some of you may remember this, for 20 years leading up to the fire, there was a heated battle about whether or not the library should be tor torn down. Because it was too small, it was in bad shape, everybody said, oh my god, it's a fire hazard. You know, famous last words, it was. And the the building itself had so much sentimental and artistic value to the people of LA. But in the course of doing my book tour, I've met several people who worked at ARCO, which had its uh, headquarters right across the street from the library. They saw the fire. And both of them said to me, we just stood there with tears in our eyes looking at the building. Now, I. I'm just saying this speculatively, but I think if you saw City Hall burning, you might say, oh man, what a mess. You know, that's awful. That's going to take a lot of time to get that back in shape. But I don't think you would have that emotional feeling of this is us. These are our stories and our narratives and, and the library feels so personal. It also, to me, um, and I was new to LA at the time that I started this book, and the myth is that there is no civic identity here. People don't feel any real connection to each other. There's no sense of, of community. And I've never quite believed that. But doing the research on this book and seeing the way people really rallied made me realize that that simply wasn't true and that that's just another story that people tell about LA. I mean, like they say, there's bad traffic. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, it only took me an hour and a half to get here. That's not bad. Bad traffic, good weather, good libraries. So at one point, you decide that you need to understand the experience of burning a book, what happens, what it, what it feels like yourself. Can you talk about that, the book you selected, and what that was like? I cannot imagine, even for the sake of research, bringing myself to do that. Well, it was not easy to do. <clears throat> and I have to admit, I, I came very close to not doing it. I decided to burn a book for, for two very particular reasons. One, well, three, really. One was, I've never seen a book burn. And in the course of wanting to write a very vivid account of the fire, it occurred to me that it would be useful if I knew just visually what happens when a book burns. Secondly, I did think about what it would have been like for the arsonist, whoever he might be, to have seen this place begin to burn. And interestingly, it was the books that burned, not the building. Yeah. The building was remarkably un uh, 
harmed by the fire. I mean, there was some damage, but it was really the books, the content that was so harmed. And by the way, just as an aside, there was insurance on the building and not on the books. <laughs> just, you know, unfortunately. But thirdly, and the, the, the reason that I really wanted to burn a book was I was really exploring this idea of why we feel so emotionally connected to books and to libraries. I was curious about this taboo about burning a book. I, you know, if you, I've burned lots of things. You know, you're sitting around a campfire and you toss stuff in and it's not a big deal and sometimes it's actually kind of interesting to see what things look like when they're burning. The idea of burning a book made me sick. It, it was so, it, it's such a taboo and it was something that I found so disturbing. I think that that's why over the course of history starting in the beginning of time from the minute that books were being made and libraries were being built, people burned them to create a sense of horror in people. So I thought, well, I find this so disturbing. I'm curious to explore that and understand because it, it told me a lot about why this story was so compelling to me. Then I had to pick a book. And that was a problem. So first I thought, well, this, this will be easy. I'll burn a book I don't like. And then I thought, that feels so wrong. It just seemed like I can't burn a book I don't like. It, it just felt much worse to me. So I thought, well, I'll burn a book I like. And then I thought, well, I can't burn a book I like. <laughs> I mean, this is crazy. So I thought, I'll just burn one of my own books. And then I thought, well, I can't do that. I mean, that, that's outrageous. I'm, I'm not going to burn one of my own books. I finally thought, you know what, I can't do this. I just can't. I felt, it felt like I would be actually killing something. And I don't think that's unique to me. I think it's, um, there is a, a quality of a vitality in a book that we feel very powerfully. So I thought, I can't do this. I'm just not going to do it. It seemed like a good idea, but I'm not. My husband one day walked in grinning ear to ear and handed me a copy of Fahrenheit 451 and said, <laughs> I found your book. <laughs> And the good thing is that I feel not only did it have a picture of a matchbook on the cover, but I do feel that Ray Bradbury would have strongly supported my decision to burn a book since he is, of course, the uh, premier um, portrayer of burning books. As well as a Los Angeles Public Library patron. For yes, him. absolutely. And, you know, a huge uh, devotee who got very involved in helping raise funds to replace those books. Um, all I can say is you cannot imagine how fast that b book burned up. It was absolutely shocking. And it actually gave me a, a little insight also into why the fire rose. It, was at, at its hottest reached 2,500 degrees and burned for seven and a half hours. I mean, books are incredible fuel, unfortunately. And this book went up so fast that I, I looked around and thought, did that just happen? I mean, that book is gone. It was gone completely. It was a paperback. And a hardcover would take a little bit longer to burn up that fast. but. It was shocking to experience it and really was a reminder to me of what ineffable quality books have that w makes them seem precious to us. So moving on from the fire a little bit, you also share the really fascinating story of the library system itself and the many very quirky people who ran it over the years. Just a few of them were Mary Foy, who was only 18 years old when she was hired to run LAPL in 1880. 
Uh, there was a woman named Tessa Kelso about 10 years later, and she already felt the need to modernize the library. We talk about that a lot these days, libraries needing to modernize, but it started right in the beginning. And the larger-than-life Charles Lummis, um, who branded his books like cows, Wyman Jones, the man who was there during the fire, and of course our current city librarian of Los Angeles, John Zabo, among others. So of all the eccentric, um, dutiful, trailblazing, and many other characteristic library leaders that you discovered in your research, did you have a soft spot for any one of them, and why? Uh, well, I have to confess I was um, quite charmed by the madcap Charles Lummis, who <clears throat> had some of the most, I mean, he, he was a very important figure in the history of Los Angeles, not only in the library, but in, in so many ways, such a significant figure in LA. But his, he had the most dramatic relationship with the library. And he took it, like I suspect, the way he took just about everything in his life, to be this passion that he had to serve. And he, this idea of him branding the books was a perfect example of that. He had a brand made that had a skull and crossbones. And he branded books that he thought had junk science in them or were just stupid books that he didn't want people to read and rather than removing them from the library he branded them with the skull and crossbones and put a bookmark in it and he wanted the bookmark to say this is the worst possible book you could ever read <laughs> and someone persuaded him to kind of rewrite that in slightly gentler tone so it, instead it said um, it's something along the lines of, it, you know, sh surely there are other books on the same topic and that you, your librarian can point you to that might be more beneficial. So he was talked down from his original position. He was an amazing figure, uh, an eccentric, a liar, uh, a fabulous, an invention of himself. He created his persona as sort of the man of the West, even though he was from Boston. He wore um, Indian clothing much of the time. He wore his hair very long, which was really radical. And, that, uh, and at the same time, he was really a genius. He started the photography collection at the library. He started, and this was very radical, a California history section. Nobody thought California had history worth, had history at all, let alone history worth keeping and having in the library. And he began that collection and the Southwest collection. There are many things in the library now that were, that came about because of his uh, innovations. and. I think he would have been a horrible husband um, and probably a horrible friend and horrible many, in many other capacities in life. But as a larger than life figure, you, you really couldn't do better than him. So what do you think um, all of these characters as well as the library itself meant in Los Angeles growing up as a city? trying to establish an identity and a history in a place that felt very new to most of the people here. Well, the fact that you know the library became very interwoven with the city's sense of itself. And there was such a, an inferiority complex in LA for such a long time. It was so much smaller and much less sophisticated than San Francisco. It was really kind of a cow town and very, backward in, in the eyes of a lot of the rest of the country. It didn't have its own standalone library well past the point when cities around the country were building these magnificent classical buildings to house their libraries. So it was a, a matter of great self-consciousness. At the time when Chicago and Philadelphia and Cleveland and New York had these beautiful big library buildings, San Francisco, everywhere but LA, 
the LA library was on the top floor of a department store. So you would ride the elevator with people who were, you know, shopping for lingerie and and, you know, cheese and then you would get up to the library. So it was a sense of great insecurity and the campaign to raise the money and pass the bond measure to raise money to build the library really harped on that point that LA was being shamed by all the other cities in the country. And this was exactly in parallel with the city's growth at, from being this small ranch town to suddenly experiencing this rapid growth, but not catching up in terms of its civic development. So when the, finally, in the 1920s, when they were building an actual standalone library, there was a real sense of pride. And that kind of parallels a point where the city was really growing and beginning to overtake the, uh, San Francisco, um, and it was just expanding wildly, and the use of the library was expanding wildly at that same time. So you also talk about your own journey as a library user, and like many people, um, you used the library as a child, drifted away from it a little bit, and then rediscovered it with your own child. Um, and coming back to libraries after some years away, uh, what did you notice? Was it, was it the same as you remembered in, and what was different? And did you feel like coming home in any way? Well, it really felt like coming home. I mean, in the, uh, libraries have innovated so much, but there is still something very fundamental about them that hasn't changed. And when I first walked into the Studio City branch when I had first moved to LA, and I had such a sense of recognition. It really shot me backward in time to my own childhood in a really wonderful way. There was so much that felt the same. The smell of the library, the sound of the library, the, the look of it. I mean, there's so much that has become innovative and modern and adapted to the time, but the, that basic feeling of walking in and just seeing the, the stacks and seeing the shelves and knowing that you could have anything in them. It was a really wonderful feeling. It, I love the idea that libraries are aware of the modern world and adapting to them, but <clears throat> I'd like to think that there will always be the core that feels so familiar and that makes you feel when you walk in that you've known this forever. Where, and really, wherever you are. I mean, I walked into the Studio City branch and felt like I was back in my home branch in Cleveland. It, it's such a, there's such a sort of familiar feeling. It almost doesn't matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I've moved a lot, and even before I became a librarian, uh, whenever I moved somewhere, I always got a library card first off, and then I knew I was, it was even more important than, you know, utility bills or anything like that. It was the thing that made me feel like I was now home, not just in a strange place. Yeah. Well, I used to get them even when I was just, um, like, renting a house for the summer, and I loved getting a library card and feeling, first of all, like how cool that I got the library card from this place where I'm just a temporary resident and yet I'm still allowed to use the library. But that feel of it is so, there's something very comforting about walking in and feeling, oh, I know this place. I know what this feels like. So you spent a lot of time um, at the LA Central Library, shadowing staff and just uh, helping out with various programs when they called you in at the last minute, and and um, observing the people who are there. And I really, I really loved your descriptions of of the kind of quirky interactions and conversations that go on. You know, the people waiting to get in at the beginning of the day, the people in the computer lab. Um, can you talk about that experience and why you wanted to immerse yourself in that way? Well, I I decided that it was really important to me not just to write 
the history of the fire, the history, the deep history of the library, but also to to capture a, a portrait of the day-to-day -day life of the library now. And I couldn't quite figure out how I was going to do that. And I have to admit, I would go downtown and sometimes just sort of walk around the library and go up and down the escalators and thinking, am I actually writing a book? Is this happening? Or am I just sort of riding around <laughs> trying to get a sense of the place? But it was actually serving a purpose. And then it occurred to me that the way it would make more sense was to go and spend a day in each department and just sit with the librarians and see what their day felt like. And not only the librarians, but also the people working in the catalog department, people who were working in the shipping department. Um, I spent a day walking around with the security guards. And it was absolutely fascinating. And you know what it really felt like? It felt like a small town. And it really made me think I was exploring a small town and John Zabo was the mayor and the you know the security guards were the police department and it it had all of the that same feeling of being interwoven and functioning as this machine but each part was very individual it it was really fun really fascinating and in each moment I thought I should get a job doing this like I was in the shipping department I thought this is cool like they're all listening to music and putting books in bins I thought this looks kind of cool and you know working in the history department or I should say sitting alongside the history librarians and thinking I should go to library school this is really cool this is so interesting <laughs> um, it, it, so it was I feel like ultimately it turned out to be a great way to do almost like slicing a tree and looking at the rings and seeing the way the place worked and how it all worked together as, as an organism. What was one thing you found out while doing that that you never would have guessed about how libraries operate? Well, when I was told that there was a shipping department, I thought, why do they need a shipping department? It seemed like, well, so they occasionally ship things, but it never seemed to be very important. And, you know, I went down and there are, there are a dozen people down there working with hundreds and thousands of books that they're sort of sorting into bins. And I thought, what are they doing? What is this all about? Not realizing that when you have a library system with 72 branches, the books that are being requested in one branch have to be transported from one to another. And to learn that 30,000 books move around the city of LA each week, to me, was extraordinary. And it also made me think how cool to imagine that there was this bloodstream of books kind of flowing through the city. It was also fascinating to see, now why would someone in uh, you know, Studio City being re request this book that happens to be only in the Rio Vista branch. You know, the the sort of odd serendipity of the way books traveled around the city or the fact that right after Thanksgiving everybody's requesting diet books. So they're all, you know, being brought in from the branches and being distributed and it, it was really wonderful. and. It made me love the idea that this, that we're doing this all kind of on the good neighbor system and all on faith that these books are being moved around and 99% of the time come back to where they came from. So when you started working on this, did you already know that you were going to write um, structure the book with the alternating chapters, the fire and the investigation into the fire, the history of the library, and then its present life? Or did that come later? How did you make that decision? Well, that came later, and it was, um, it, was very, it was a really challenging book. Frankly, probably the hardest book I've written, because I had 
these very distinct storylines that were also distinct in terms of when in history they had occurred. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I didn't want to write it chronologically because I felt like that would be incredibly dull to, you know, begin in 1880. It, it just seemed like that's going to not interest anybody. So I decided to write it the way I might have told it out loud. That I, you know, people would say, what's your book about? And I would always say, well, it's about this fire that occurred that was the biggest library fire in the history of the United States. And then I would kind of roll back and begin telling the story of the way the library kind of came to be and sort of setting the stage for the fire. And at the same time, still wanting to kind of be in the present moment and share the story of all of these different elements that make the library function. So it, it was a huge challenge, but I kind of followed what felt instinctively right and hoped that readers would be able to follow this timeline even though it moved back and forth so much. And I think it really did work because you could kind of, there were some of the sadder chapters and then some of the more humorous chapters and some of the more um, you know factual chapters and you you kind of got to change your mood up a little bit and and then go back into it when you're ready yeah well the, and that was very you know some of it was wanting to have pacing that would be appealing to a reader and that you know after you write a long chapter about all the, um, the billions of books that have been burned in wars over time that maybe it would be good to take a little break and write about something that was a little more uplifting. Um, so, you know, that, that pacing seemed really important to me. So I want to turn it over for questions in just a moment, but sure. before that, I just want to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, the question that all library professionals spend all their time asking themselves these days is, what can we do to make sure that libraries can survive into the future? And I was just wondering, based on your observations and your personal experiences and all your research, if you had figured that out. you have any advice for us? Good coffee. <laughs> You know, I, <clears throat> I'm only half kidding. I think that I feel like we are entering an age where we more and more are reminded of the great pleasure of sharing public space. And what I look to is Starbucks. And I think, you know, anybody could make a cup of coffee at home. Part of the pleasure is to go somewhere where there are other humans and to share the space with other people. Libraries are so perfectly poised to be that. Most of the changes that I think and the innovations that have come over the last, say, 10 years have really headed in that direction. I think that to remind people that they are a, a wonderful public space to share is going to ensure that we continue embracing them and appreciating them and using them. And whether it's to say it's a nice place to go and work or it's a nice place to meet a friend or it's a nice place just to go and browse and pick a book off the shelf and look at something interesting. I think all the programming that's happening is really wonderful. I mean, all of that but I will admit, I did say to John Zabo, I felt, I went to see this amazing new library in Denmark, and they have the best coffee. And <laughs> the place is just mobbed. And I said, you know, coffee, it seems to be the answer to everything. <laughs> and, um, and I would like you all to support me on that, because I feel that if we bring great coffee to our libraries, <laughs> We're going to see, uh, honest to God, I'm only half kidding. Um, just in, in, in that sense that it reminds people that this is our, our public, essentially it's a public park for the mind. 
and the way that you can enjoy it as a place to be will ensure that we preserve them for time immemorial. Whether every single book in the world gets digitized won't matter because we still yearn for places to be together and to be and to share community. Well, thank you for this delightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all so much for being here. And we will we have time for questions. Which so for is those of you who great. have questions, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. I enjoy your talk very much. Two questions. Sure. Did the suspected arsonist have a motive to burn books? And the second question is, of all the books that were lost, were all of them replaced somehow? Did they know which ones were lost and did they find replacements? Um, those are both great questions. The only motive that Harry Peake could have had, at least the only one that ever made sense, was he was somebody who loved attention. And there are a certain number of arson fires that are set by people they, firefighters call them hero fires. Someone will start a fire with the intention of putting it out and looking like a hero. Theoretically, he might have had that in mind, started the fire, and then it just got out of control. And he panicked and left. He certainly never, there was no, no evidence that he had any grudge against the library. In fact, there's no evidence he had ever been in the library before that, which is the one, one of the many confounding facts since it, it's not clear why he would have gone in the library that day. He was not somebody who was a library user. So it, it's a really puzzling thing. I mean, libraries over the course of history have been burned on intentionally for political reasons. Um, and, and then you have pyromaniacs who just start places on fire. He did not have political motives, for sure. So the only thing that might have explained it was this idea that he would look like a hero. Were all the books replaced? I can't answer that precisely. Every attempt was made to rebuild the collection, but some of that material was not replaceable. Um, it was material that was no longer available. And then some of it, like the whole patent collection burned up. That was replaced. Um, this, the cookbook section, which was the largest one in the US, they got what they could, but you can't just go and order them all. It, it's, these are collections that are built over many, many, many years, and much of the material is just not can't be found again. Thanks again for coming here tonight. Um, you mentioned earlier about the, um, the labor that was necessary to restore things and, and just the time. And I was wondering what paid for that? And um, was that difficult to come up with the funds for? Because it wasn't that about the same time that they were finding funds for the edition that became the Tom Bradley edition later on. So I'm wondering yeah. how all that came together. And again, where did they find the money for it? Um, well, that, it's a sort of interesting thing. The way the edition was actually financed was by selling the air rights. Um, and this was a very novel idea at the time, but the library, as you know, is not that tall, but it had zoning rights to be much taller. And n n I would say either no one had done an air rights deal in LA at that point, or maybe it had been tried once it's a way of financing by selling your right to build higher um, to someone else in an adjoining property who wants to build above what they're zoned for. So the library sold their air rights and they also sold, it's interesting, it's like a sandwich. They also sold the rights to dig under the library and build this huge parking garage. But that, none of that money paid for the books. The money to pay to replace the books was raised by the city of Los Angeles and the people of Los Angeles. They had big corporate donors, but a lot of that money, $20 million, was raised 
from donations, some of which were large and a lot of which were very small. And that paid for the books. Uh, thank you for coming to Burbank. Uh, the question I have is, was there ever, ever any part of the investigation that looked into the potential theft of like manuscripts, valuable books, and the fire was started to cover up the thefts that you really couldn't know what was lost or what was taken or what was stolen. Oh, wow. That's a whole twist. I, um, I don't think that was ever pursued, um, though there were, uh, I mean, and as it happens, the rare book department did not burn which was incredibly fortunate because among other things, all the library's archives were in there and that's what made it possible for me to write my book. So I'm very glad of that. But um, that I don't think anyone ever pursued that theory. And fires are often started to cover up other crime. I mean, a lot of times, for instance, you'll murder someone, as one does, and then you, <laughs> You start a fire so that the body is um, hard, it's hard to tell that the person was murdered and instead it looks like they were killed in the fire. And that happens, I won't say frequently, but um, arson is a very good way to cover up other crime. But I don't think it was ever pursued in, the case, in, in this particular case. Um, are, do you know if the books in the um, LA um, library system are now insured? You know, somebody asked me that the other day and I, I felt terrible that I couldn't answer that. And I, I'm gonna ask because now I'm very curious. And you know, it's very, insurance is very weird. And if I, when I wrote The Orchid Thief, um, you know, when Hurricane Andrew came through Florida and it was incredibly devastating and it, it destroyed countless numbers of greenhouses, the greenhouses themselves were not, don't cost that much, but all the plants inside were destroyed and they can't be insured. It, there was no insurance on the plants. So it's, it's a very weird thing. I, it, I think Insurance likes durable things like buildings and doesn't like something like plants. So all of those um, nursery people lost all their money. They got nothing or they got the a pittance for their actual greenhouses but nothing at all for their plants. And it struck me as very similar to the library. Hi, I was just wondering what day of the week and uh, did this fire occur and was anybody hurt? I mean, did they uh, get it evacuated? It was a Tuesday or? and I can double check that, but I think it was a Tuesday and uh, a number of firefighters were hospitalized um, because the heat was so extreme and they had heat exhaustion and burns from the fire. Normally the oxygen um, canisters that they use last an hour and in this case they lasted 10 minutes because the heat was so extreme that they were breathing very, very heavily and they had to rotate out every 10 minutes. Um, but yeah, I think there were about 22, I'm sorry because I can't remember the number exactly, but I think 22 firefighters were injured. Um, fortunately nobody was, of. Two of them were hospitalized overnight. Many of them were injured and then they were able to be released immediately. No patrons were hurt because everyone thought it was a false alarm, but they all evacuated and it started rather slowly. So everybody got out of the building. I was wondering, uh, you said the building itself wasn't that damaged. You have all those beautiful murals there. Surely they were damaged from smoke and water. Um, surprisingly not. They were actually, and this is a, kind of funny, they were so dirty that the, the dirt provided a kind of layer of protection. Um, you know, the building was in very bad shape in the 80s. 
and they honestly feel that the 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 dirt and grease that covered the murals um, ended up protecting them from much damage. Yeah, and as far as water, it's surprisingly the water, most of the water was being drenched into the stacks and the stacks did not have any decorative, you know, the stacks were just basically concrete, small concrete tubes that went all the way to the ceiling of the building and none of the decorative uh, surfaces were in those stacks and those were destroyed um, but luckily the fire you know there were like the room that is now the rare book room if any of you have been in there was very badly damaged but the murals that are in the main public areas were fortunately not harmed which is really quite miraculous. Yes, I was uh, curious, um, at the beginning of each chapter, you cited a number of books with their titles and everything. Uh, how did you pick those out? Um, it, you know, I, started, I came up with the idea that I wanted to do that when I was looking up a book that one of the um, city librarians, Althea Warren, had made a reference in a uh, comment where she was encouraging people always to like cancel plans and lie to their friends and say they had to stay home and so they could read and she was a great advocate saying you know lie to your aunt Nellie that you can't come to dinner and just stay home and read a book and she mentioned a book Lucy Gayhart and I thought oh I want to look up that book I wonder if it's in the catalog so I looked it up and there it was and I don't know about you, but once I get into something like an online catalog, it's like the wormhole. And I started just looking up all these other books, and then I started thinking of topics. I thought, I wonder if there's a book on this topic and that topic. Cemeteries in Missouri, and there would be like 10 books. So I, I just became fascinated by the catalog. and thought it would be a wonderful way to foreshadow the chapters and to also give in, a, in an indirect way a, a little hint to people of the vastness of the resources of the library that these are all books that are currently in the LA library. They are there. Yeah, yeah. Someone asked me if they were ones that had been destroyed, but they're not. They're, they're books that are currently in the catalog. So I tried to have e all of them somehow refer to something in the chapter. It was really fun. Okay. Um, my name, I'll say it, is Donna Hovartis. I am a retired librarian from LAPL. I was in the system when the fire occurred. And I want to thank you for doing this book. Yes. You're the first person who recognized us what we went through, much of what you say is so true. People don't understand what the stacks were like. I was there. I knew what it was like to walk on boards and not on a floor in those stacks. Why the stacks burned separate from the building, people don't understand in the 20s when they build it. There was no floor strong enough to hold all those books. They're heavy. They built the stacks and they built the building around the stacks, so like a square chimney. And if you look on the top tier, you can look eight floors straight down. You know, it was, it was, you know, it was an experience. Well, they, they function really like chimneys, They did. It was a chimney. It really was a chimney, yeah. you know. And I've been into that place before and after and all the support. And I want to thank you for bringing it out. And it was very refreshing. The only thing is they do 32,000 items a day out of shipping every day. Not 32,000 a week. Did I say a week? Yes, it's supposed oh, to be a once day. a day. A day. So. <laughs> okay. wow. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing what we do. Yeah, oh, well, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I also enjoy the, uh, the way the book is presented physically uh, with no dust cover, which I assume would just add to its flammability, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
But the information that we would find on a dust cover is, is inside on the end papers. There are lots of really nice book design touches, and I wondered if you worked uh, closely with the woman who's, who's given the credit for that. Um, well, thank you. I think it's absolutely gorgeous, and I, I, am, I just love it. I love touching it. I'm just thrilled with how it turned out. And I did, um, I did work very closely with them because I had an idea of it not having a dust jacket, just having text on the cover, not a picture. And I didn't know how we would sort of work out the issues of, you know, there has to be copies somewhere. And that I give them all the credit for. But it was... For the six years I was working on the book, I was constantly doodling and doodling a little version of the cover, which was that it would just say the library book and be as is. And they um, told me about this incredible textured material that they could use for the cover, which I love. So, But thank you. I, we've gotten such amazing response to the the book itself. and. Um, it makes me really happy. It's nice that it's appreciated as a physical object. So, uh, so I guess I have the pleasure of having asking the last question. Um, in your travels to other libraries, like you've said, Denmark and New York, and you mentioned that the that the library here in Los Angeles suffered fire and water damage. What fire suppression systems or fire prevention systems have you seen at other libraries? to prevent something like this from happening, and um, can you expand a little bit as to maybe how that could be employed here? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because LA was just an accident waiting to happen. It didn't have fire doors, it didn't have any fire suppression, it was over full. Um, it, you know, there were books stacked everywhere, stuck under shelves, piled up in corners. It, it had the wiring was totally inadequate. As a matter of fact, the woman who was the head of Central Library at the time of the fire wrote her master's thesis about the fire hazards in the LA Library. Now, not all of that is to blame on. LA because until 1986 the American Library Association recommended against sprinklers and for the very reason that water is so damaging for books and the concern was if sprinklers went off accidentally you would have a disaster on your hands. So it, it was only in 1986 that and you know the timing was ironic, but only in 1986 did the ALA change their position and begin recommending sprinklers. And that was partly probably because sprinkler systems, which had been very crude and, you know, were advanced to the point that, you know, they, they could be targeted, there could be a way that they could be turned off when it, if it was found to be accidental and so forth. So LA was way behind where it should have been, but there that was a an inflection point where libraries were had no if you don't have sprinkler system, I'm not sure besides a fire extinguisher what else you could have that would work. I know some rare book libraries have um it's like a gas a, a, more of a gas um Halon system for for fire, but it's a it's a tricky thing when water, which is the typical way of putting out a fire, is just as damaging as fire, or in some cases arguably more damaging. But I think we, it's safe to say that the LA Library is probably in much better shape now than it was. <laughs> and the stacks, which were such an incredibly unfortunate, perfect storm for a fire, 
um, are no longer being used and the books are not stored in the stacks anymore and they were kind of opened up and turned into rooms in the library instead of being these closed chimneys, basically. All right, so if you would like to get your book signed, we'll start the line over here. And can you please join me in thanking our author once again? Yeah.